to guide, look upon, be my side. As I wait. Good morning, church. We are delighted that you are here today to worship together. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Kelly, and I have a few announcements for us. First is that we are growing our deacon body, and so if you have recommendations on a man that you would recommend um, as a deacon, you can submit those online or in the lobby. Also, we have some opportunities to gather coming up. Our next Grace 101 luncheon will be held on October 27th, and this is an opportunity to learn more about our church, theology, structure, beliefs, and we'll feed you yummy food. So you can sign up online or in the lobby. Next on November 2nd, we have a women's brunch at 9.30, and our speaker will be Sharon Zaring, and she's a, she's a rep from Operation Christmas Child. <laughs> Next, our Trimble campus is having a chili cook-off on November 10th at 6 p.m. Please come. And if you want to submit a, a little crock pot of chili, that'd be great. We have a couple opportunities to grow together as well. Monday night, our men's study has resumed, but it's not too late to join. It starts at 6.30 p.m. tomorrow. And then also, discipleship groups are... Our discipleship pathway is getting ready to kind of launch. So if you are interested in finding out more about that, you can sign up online or in the lobby. And then we have a couple opportunities to grow or to go. We have a trunk or treat on October 27th from 6 to 7 p.m. out here in the um, parking lot. We roughly get about 400 kids that come through. So we would love some cute cars or trucks decorated and just people with a smiling face passing out candy to people in our community. Um, that's from 6 to 7 on October 27th. You can sign up online or in the lobby. And also, Operation Christmas Child, that is a ministry that Grace is pretty significantly involved in. And so we will begin kind of um, packing boxes. Uh, we are a drop-off site, so people will be bringing their boxes here. We will have a packing party. So if you at all have a desire to get involved in that ministry, we would love your help. So... Um, this morning we have a real treat. Joe is home from college, so this is Joe Sanders, and he's going to read our scripture. So will you guys stand to honor God's word? Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Praises rising, eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. Hope is stirring, hearts are yearning for you. We long for When we see you, we find strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away. They're washed away.
Gary doing a great job back here on the drums this morning. He is. Whenever I have uh, some of the youth come up and play, I, I usually have other youth that come up and say, I want to get up there too. So I'm just going to tell you right now, if you're one of those youth, you gotta, you got to be serving in the youth group on their worship team. And then we'll bring you in at some point. So those of you that are serving on the worship team in there, Izzy, your day's coming. <laughs> no, we just love it. We love it when we're raising these kids up to do this. And um, sat yesterday we had men's breakfast, and Gary was challenging the young people to memorize Psalm 139. And I know I saw some of the blue sheets flying around here. I, I saw you got one this morning, didn't you, Danica? Yeah, he's challenging the youth to memorize 139. I'm challenging the adults to do it. I'm not going to pay you. <laughs> Gary's giving thirty dollars. Yeah, but Gary's giving thirty bucks out if you're under twenty years of age and you memorize that thing. So David Lynn will give you fifty. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but God is worthy. He's worthy of uh, our praise this morning. So as we sing, as we continue to sing, uh, let's just give Him all the glory and all of our attention this morning, and mean it when you sing it. All right.
Father, we thank you for the blood of Jesus. For the love that, it, that endures forever, Lord. And that's a long, long time. Lord, when we don't deserve your grace and your mercy, you see, somehow you see uh, past everything that we've ever done to, to separate us from you. And that's because of what Jesus did for us. That's how you can do it. So, Lord, we thank you. We give you honor and praise this morning. You're worthy of our adoration and our attention. Lord, as we open your word this morning, may you uh, just peel back all of those things that keep us from knowing you even better. Help us to learn uh, the goodness of God, the goodness of your grace and your mercy. Lord, help us to see more clearly the needs around us and those people that are hurting. Help us to be light in a dark community. Lord, we love you and we praise you and we give you this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you find your seats, if you have a kindergarten or a first grader, they can be dismissed now for We Worship. They're, they're talking about prayer this month, and uh, I'll, just, I'll tell you what they're learning. Last week, they learned how to talk to God, and today they're going to learn how to listen to God. So they may come back with big ears on their head, I understand, so um, might quiz them on that. If you will open your Bibles to Romans 14, Romans 14, we... Uh, well, let me just do the introduction and kind of get in. Today's a weird Sunday for me. I'm not sure if I'm summarizing something or I'm just introducing something, but we're not going to get into all of it today. There's just a lot here. Um, but I want to give you an overview at least. So let me just start by picking a fight with you. Uh, best barbecue in Kansas City. All right. Now we can all come to this meeting here together and we can argue about whether it's, and I could go through my list, if I, and I will go through my list, but you may argue with this. There's Joe's, of course, right? And there's Jack Stack, uh, old school Arthur Bryant's. And I'm just doing this out on YouTube. Everybody on the planet knows we have the best barbecue in, in our area. Uh, Zarda's, uh, Chops here in town. Anybody go to Woodyard Barbecue? I love Woodyard Barbecue. Or Slaps Barbecue over in Kansas City, Kansas. Good ribs. If we were going to like sit in sections of favorite barbecue, um, we might have interesting discussions. Well, in the Old Testament, they fought about that. Um, they literally did. They had uh, fought about what kind of meat to eat, and it was whether it had been sacrificed to idols or not. And, and I can't help it, but it literally was a barbecue. You would bring your sacrifice to the temple, whether it's the Jewish temple as a, 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 a Jewish person or a pagan temple in Rome or Corinth, and you would sacrifice the lamb or the goat or whatever it was, and that would be divided into thirds. The priest would get one third of it, okay, and they would eat off, and it, it, and it would have been a bloody mess, but it would have also smelled like barbecue. I mean, it's just they're cooking this meat, and so a, a third would go to the priest, and a third you would get to eat off of and a third they would sell because there was more than enough meat around. And so that it was the best kind of meat, but some of it had been sacrificed to a pagan god first and then sold at the shop next door. And then the Christians started arguing about whether it was okay or not to eat that meat because it had at one time been sacrificed to an idol, a pagan idol. And, uh, and they would also, there was this thought, and, and it bled over even to Judaism, that when you eat that meat, somehow you're opening the door at least, or you're honoring even that pagan idol. And so the Christians would fight about, well, you can't eat that because that's from slaps, and slaps, you know, sacrifices to that pagan idol. And so they would begin to fuss about it. And that sounds far removed, and it's kind of a joke to think about barbecue, but we fight about similar things, and we don't even realize it. Uh, again, I, I may be scatterbrained this morning, and it's just, there's a lot here. Several years ago when COVID happened, one of my deepest prayers was that we don't let a piece of cloth over a mouth split a church, okay? Do you realize how silly that would have been? Now, some of you have very strong opinions on both sides of that, and we know because we heard it, right? How the devil would have won over a piece of cloth, Right? And so in the next couple weeks, at least, as we go through this rock'em, sock'em Christian thing, what, I want you to do two things, and, and this is going to take hard work. One thing is, 
you need to think inside the walls of the church and not outside the walls to the culture. Paul, Jesus, spent a whole lot of time talking about how we are to behave among one another and not so much about how we're to tell them what for, okay? Now, I'll speak to this in a second, but he's talking to us about us. And this is going to take just incredible, I think, discipline on your part. He's talking to you. He's not talking to the person sitting next to you. He's talking to you. He's talking to me. Because we're going to read some things and we're going to say, you know who needs to hear that? He's talking to the very people who don't think they need to hear it, but that's who he's talking to. So just like a laser focus as we go through these verses and through these ideas, I want you to think, what does, what does God want me to hear and me to apply in this situation? Okay? Be very selfish in that this morning. Okay? So here we go. Here's how this is going to happen. Romans 14. Rome, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 1 Corinthians 8, 1 Corinthians 11. We talked about Lord's Supper last week. Paul gets on these rants about what do you do when somebody else disagrees with you or you disagree on something. I've chosen to kind of at least introduce this in Romans 14. You could very easily go to 1 Corinthians 8 and hear the same ideas, um, slightly different setting, but it has to do with the sacrifice to idols and the food that they eat. And um, I want you, I've got you at Romans 14. We're just going to flash sporadic verses on the screen, not the whole thing. So get your Bibles open. Be ready to flip back and forth a little bit this morning between Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians. Um, but here's verse 1, Romans 14. I'm going to read this one and just say this is what I'm really after today. Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. Okay, let me just say that one more time. Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. I'm going to spend most of my time honing in on that this morning and using other verses to get us to understand what, what that means. So let me pray, and then we're going to flash a few more verses up, but let me just pray. God, help us accept the one whose faith is weak and not quarrel over disputable matters. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Paul goes on to write, and again, all these will not be on the screen, so uh, everybody kind of be patient. One person's faith allows them to eat anything. I'm in verse 2 there. But another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. Okay? This is not a vegan thing. It's just It has to do with the pagans and the sacrifices. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. So let me focus on that for a second. Whether you're the weak or the strong in this argument, Paul says, don't judge the other person. Amen. Okay? It works both ways. Because you can take these texts and say, well, I'm the strong one or I'm the weak one and you have to do that. You both are commended by Paul. Don't look down on the other person. Why? Because Jesus has accepted both of you. Okay, that's an important verse. Verse 4, who are you to judge someone else's servant to their own master, servant stand or fall? And they will stand for the Lord is able to make them stand. One person considers one day more sacred than the other. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord and whoever eats meat does so to the Lord for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. You then... Why do you judge your brother or sister? There's where I was telling you, focus on the church, not the culture so much. Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me and every tongue will acknowledge God. So then, each of us will give account of ourselves to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, and here's a verse we'll throw up on the screen, Make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. So while I'm asking you to think about how this applies to you, the way that applies is 
is how am I living that affects another believer? Okay? I have to consider that. I don't just have the freedom to do whatever I want. I have to think about how it affects other Christians. Verse 14. I am convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. So he's saying, I can eat whatever I want, right? But if anyone regard, regards something as unclean, then let that person, for that person, it is unclean. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love, okay? Just both Romans 13, I'm sorry, yeah, Romans 13 and 1 Corinthians 13, Paul talks about how important love for other people is. Jesus says, you will, they'll know you're my disciples, how you love one another. What Paul is doing here is saying, here's one way you apply love. It's one thing to say, I love my, my you know, brothers and sisters in Christ until we disagree about something. No, he's saying you exactly show that love when you disagree with one another. Okay, that's another rant there. Um, you're no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what you know is good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. Here's another verse we'll throw on the screen. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. Do not de destroy the work of God for the sake of food. Okay? That was my illustration about the mask. How, how dumb it would have been to destroy the work of God because of a mask or something like that. All food is clean. But it is wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. So whether you, whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what he approves, but whoever has doubts is condemned if they eat because their eating is not from faith and everything that does not come from faith is sin. Okay? Now we're going to stop there in Romans 14, but I want to put some other verses on the screen that come from 1 Corinthians. So 1 Corinthians 6, he's talking about lawsuits. Uh, people in the church were suing one another. And boy, these are tough. Verse 7 of that verse says, Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? One thing to ask yourself, and I ask it all the time, because we get worked up about things. And I scream at TVs, and I scream at radios, and I probably scream at you when you're not within earshot. And I scream at myself when I feel these emotions boil up show me the bible verse that says anything but that jesus when led to the slaughter kept silent okay remember i'm talking in the church just keep all that in mind we get riled up and we tell you what for and i'm like just show me the verse that says you're supposed to do that that is not the way christ behaved that's not the way his followers are to behave okay hard verses right i told you i was gonna make you mad this morning um, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, again, talking about food sacrifice to idols. Uh, this is verse 1. We know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Okay? This was almost what I wanted to focus on this morning. Here's what he's saying is, you might be right, and you might be right. You can both be right about something, especially when it comes to how you're going to behave in a disputable manner. But what happens is you think you're so right that you need to tell the other person that they're wrong sometimes. And I'm not, I'll, I'll get to this later. I'm not talking about indisputable matters. I'm talking about disputable matters. Okay? If you know something, elsewhere I think Jesus or Paul would say, we, you only know in part. Okay? It's the old adage of two blind guys go up to an elephant and one guy grabs a tail and one guy grabs the tusk. And you say, describe an elephant to me. Right? They will both describe what they're feeling, and they're both right, but it's not the full picture. And for some people, it was wrong to eat food because that's their background or whatever. For others, it was right to eat that food. And they both have some knowledge, but they, we are not to use what we know to be true to beat other people up or to hold ourselves above, to puff up. It's the illustration of a balloon. Getting, we just get full of ourselves because we think we know better than everybody else. 
But love actually builds other people up. It's, it's a whole dynamic of, am I thinking about how special I am or how I can still love this person even if we disagree on a disputable matter? Verse 8 of that same section, 1 Corinthians. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He was talking about should he be paid is what the context is here. We did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Our primary goal is to bring people to Jesus. And the, the language there, I think I alluded to this last week. If you can't tell, I'm kind of worked up about this. Last week is to hinder means to literally dig a trench on a road that leads to something. And everybody's on this journey, hopefully coming to Christ for the first time or growing in Christ-like character. And we fight over secondary things and we put obstacles between the smooth transition to following Christ in a fuller matter. And we'd rather fight over the secondary thing and it keeps them from either accepting or understanding the gospel in a fuller way. We literally put up roadblocks when we do this. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 23 and 24. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. And then finally, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 33, I think. I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. It really is a question of priorities, right? What's most important, that I be right about some secondary issue or that I reflect and draw people to Jesus Christ and the gospel? So here's my outline. Again, I don't know if, I'm, I may get this all out of my system this morning, okay? And I'll feel, okay, I said what I need to say. Or I may say, we're just tapping into this and we're gonna have to dig into those passages next week. We'll see. The first point I have is disputable matters. So that's the language that Paul uses in Romans 14, he says, and, and again, the one verse, if we get no further than this, I'll, I'll be somewhat satisfied. Accept one another whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. Let me break that verse down. First of all, the word accept one another. It does not mean put up with one another. It literally means take them to yourself like a family member, okay? Um, we got to visit with in-laws yesterday and and from the other side not my in-laws but like now I'm the in-laws of another whole family and you get to know these people and you get to love these people right I had two sons I have now two daughters-in-law who I love and I who knew I love these girls right I have accepted them into my family I mean I don't know I mean I'm sure I'll find out there's certain things we disagree with along the way but it's more than just put up with them it's take them to yourself embrace them Draw them, build a relationship with them. And even in the church, we tend to say, well, they believe this and I believe that. And so, yeah, we're all saved, but, right? As soon as that word but gets in there, you're on the wrong road. Amen. What Paul is saying is accept them, take them in. And not, and this would go on in, somewhere in one of those passages, he says, don't bring them in just so you can lecture them that they're wrong. This is not, like we might technically say in the church, well, you can technically be a member of the church because you believe a couple things that we say you need to believe. It's to embrace them and see them as a fellow brother or sister in Christ, as Paul says a couple times, because Jesus died for them. Which, by the way, is the key to why you can accept other people, because he accepted you when you don't agree with everything that he does and says. You're not acting exactly like Jesus, and he embraced you, and he adopted you into his family. So when he starts by saying, accept one another, that's where we start. It's, it's more than just, you know, okay, I'll tolerate you. And then here's the fun one, whose faith is weak, okay? First of all, it's natural, I'm almost, almost going to say all of us do this, but it's natural to think, well, I'm the strong one, they're the weak one. I'll just warn you, if your thinking is like that, you're probably the weak one, okay? So I want you to start from there. I want you to start by thinking, I'm the one who doesn't fully understand something. I'm the weaker one. Admit that. I know for a fact there's areas of the Christian life that I am the weak one. Because I know what the Bible says about it, but I still have a hesitancy about it. I'm the one whose faith is weak. And I'll, I'll hone in on this a little bit. 
There is a definite article before the word faith. You might say, well, who cares? We're not talking about I believe a little and you really believe. We're talking about the doctrine that we believe. So the faith is the Christian doctrine. Let's go over that real quickly. We're not perfect. God created us. We've fallen. We're sinful. Jesus died in our place and everything we ever did wrong, if we accept him, has been credited to his account. He was punished for everything we've ever done wrong. Everything we failed to do right, he did right and we get credit for his righteousness. Okay, That's the gospel. If I understand that, then what can I do to keep God from accepting me? Class, nothing. Because it's not based on what I did. It's based on what he did. Let me extend that. What can that person do that keeps them further from God? Same gospel is nothing. They may disagree with you, and I'll go into, I mean, we'll get into the weeds here in a second. He's talking about diet. Most of us don't fight about that. He's talking about drinking. Uh oh. Right? He's, he, he talks about what days are special. Have you ever heard people in the church argue about whether we should celebrate ha- ha- Halloween or not? or Christmas or not because of the pagan background of that, or Valentine's Day, and you want to get into the weeds, don't call it Monday because that was named after the moon god. Or Tuesday, or don't call it March because that's from Mars. I mean, we can fight about anything, right? And what he's saying is what you believe, what you eat, does not make you better in God's eyes or worse in God's eyes. So it is the weak person who thinks The weak in their faith, they don't understand the gospel in the full extent that I can literally do anything and I'm still accepted as a child of God. And Paul will put those guidelines on there, but not everything's right and not everything's beneficial. But I can't drink so much God doesn't love me and I can't not drink so much that God loves me anymore. It is the person that doesn't fully understand that faith that is the weak one. And I will fully admit I'm weak in some areas. We covered this when we covered deacons. Because of my background and my history and all kinds of things, and and because of what I think the Bible says about some things, drinking is one of those issues. As elders in this church, we limit our liberty. We understand the Bible gives some permission there, but we're not going to do it. That puts me in the weaker category, not the stronger category. And I understand that. What Paul is saying is this, put up with one another. And think about how your action will do something over there. I'll give you another great example. Um, about what is disputable or what is not. And by, by the way, uh, we dispute over what is disputable. <laughs> let, let me say that again because only the second row got it. We dispute over what is disputable. I'm getting to who is Jesus, what's the authority of the scripture, what is the gospel, and some other issues. And you might dispute about me, but in, in a few weeks we get to go to the polls in America, right? We get to actually vote. Amendment three is about abortion. I think it's indisputable that we cannot support such an amendment, okay? Now, there's two other amendments on gambling, and I have very strong opinion on this, everything from how it's ruining the sports to how it's ruining families, but the Bible's not quite as clear on gambling as it is on murder, okay? So just when you go to the polls in a few weeks, this is more disputable, the gambling ones, right? But the murder one, you know, that's less disputable. How one gets saved or whatever. So don't, don't take this to mean everything's possible now. No, we don't murder. We don't blaspheme. We don't, there are certain things we don't do and we shouldn't have to argue about those things. Now you may argue about how it's applied and all that kind of stuff, but at the basics, there are disputable matters and there's indisputable matters. Keep those separate. Don't make an indisputable, I'm sorry, a disputable matter become an indisputable matter. And churches split all the time over stuff like this. They argue about what are are not the key things. And so we need to keep in mind what is disputable and, and what is not. And again, we argue about that, which is exactly why we need to hear this, is because maybe we're the weaker one in this, and just to keep that. And then he says to do it without quarreling. Well, I... I kind of like to argue about things, don't you? We do with family, we do with friends. And we can have discussions. This is nowhere in here. I mean, think about even Peter, who was trying to figure out whether he should be eating food that was called unclean, and God had to send him a vision of a of a you know blanket coming down out of heaven and says, eat it all. Because you're no better if you eat or uneat. Nothing you eat is going to make you unclean. 
You have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. So accept the Gentiles. And so the, the first idea is, I, I don't even know about you, yeah, biblical faith. When he says whose faith is weak, the weak person is the one, because we, we tend to think of it this way. I'm of the strong faith because I stand on these things. And what Paul is saying is, no, you're the weak one because you don't understand the freedom of the gospel. However... If you're the strong one which says nothing can make me unclean, then accept those who think differently. In fact, yield your liberty to those who think differently. Because that's the law of love. That's how you love one another. Is you don't demand your rights. You think about how your rights affect other people and you yield to them. Okay? So that's biblical faith. B is biblical freedom. I think we read these verses in 1 Corinthians. I have the right to do anything. Now, if you look at that and say, doors open, I'm driving through, right? That's not what Paul's saying. Because he goes on to say, not everything's beneficial. I know I can't sin so much that, God, that Jesus' blood will not forgive me. That doesn't mean I start sinning. Paul will write about that elsewhere. It also doesn't mean I start sinning in such a way that somebody else sees that as a problem and it affects their faith. And that's kind of what this whole passage is talking about. I have to think about somebody else and how they will see that and how they will, um, he, he says in here about their faith will be damaged, in fact, because of that. So I have biblical freedom, but not everything is constructive. I should not seek my own good, but the good of others. And some people, and I think, again, you can go both ways, weak or strong here, but they just see, well, I can do whatever I want. No, you can't. You have to think about how other people perceive that. Amen. Thirdly is biblical fellowship. And this is really what Paul's driving at is, hey, we can argue about some of those things. We can, let me put it this way. We can disagree about some of these things. But to the point where the, the picture of the gospel as seen in the church is damaged, quit it. Biblical fellowship is not just we get together and we kind of like each other. It is bringing together people on opposing ends and unifying at the cross of Jesus Christ. Because that's the gospel, is people who were sinners are brought together with a holy God. We can have fellowship with God because of Christ. Certainly we can have fellowship with one another because of Christ. And this is why Jesus would say, they will know you're my disciples if you love one another. And he doesn't mean just because you all get along. He means even when there's disagreements, the blood of Christ unifies you. And it sacrifices for one another. That's why I pointed out both Romans 13 and 1 Corinthians 13 say, this is the law of love. This is how you love one another. You lay down your life for your brother. You lay down your life for someone else. Your focus is on how is this going to affect them. And I could give you the verses, first Romans 14, 3 and 4. Don't treat them with content. Don't judge them. Verse 14, he goes into this whole thing about give your account of yourself to God. Listen, that other person may be wrong, but they're going to have to answer to God, not you in that situation. Just like you're not going to have to answer to them in that situation. This is, this is quite freeing, both in the way I live my life and the way I see others live their lives. Okay, I don't have to go around lecturing everybody. Um, I, I really wrestled with this even this week. Hopefully over 24, almost 25 years here at Grace, we've taught you we've taught ourselves how to think about things biblically what you don't need is somebody that tells you what to think about things does that make a difference to you if you just come and expect me to tell you what the bible says about something then you're depending on my interpretation of something i want you to know your bibles and be in in connection to the holy spirit and god to say god what does the bible say about this and you make those decisions i would much rather have a bunch of mature believers than a bunch of people that just do whatever the church says to do that gets you in trouble in all kinds of ways. And so we have this fellowship that, that is where, where he would say things like, don't do something that causes somebody else to sin. In their setting, Paul will say, I will literally never eat meat again if it causes somebody else to fall. Think about that, Kansas City. Never eat barbecue again because somebody else might fall in that? Would you go that far? No. And we're talking about barbecue. But think of the other issues here. I mean, do I need, I don't think I need to go through the list. 
All those, this is why I'm saying focus on you. What do you see other people do and say, well, they can't be a Christian or they're not as mature of a Christian if they do that or don't do that, right? I could go through, I don't want to go through the list because I don't want you all to start, start fighting about it with me after the services. Secondly, differing maturities. So this is when he gets into who's wise and who's weak and all this kind of stuff. A, I have the wise Christian, and I've already covered this a little bit. This is 1 Corinthians 8, verses 1 and 2. We, all, we know that we all possess knowledge. So we all know something, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. So just that little contrast there, think of that. When you have a disagreement, even in your mind with somebody or some issue, does it make you feel superior that you think you know better than somebody else? Or they're just not mature enough, Right? In Paul's context, again, he flips it on his head and he says, you may be the weak one here. You may be the person that thinks, well, they're not doing it the right way, so their faith just isn't that strong. What Paul's saying is, no, you're the legalist here because you're, you're weak. You don't understand that Christ has set you free, right? So that's the second point. But first is the wise Christian. We all possess knowledge. I got this question asked yesterday by family members. Uh, I won't give you the question because I don't want to fight, but... And well, let, yeah, I'll, I will tell you this. It had to do with schooling, okay? I have children who are now having children, and they're like, tell me about public school, private school, homeschooling, all that kind of stuff. And we landed on this. It really depends on the setting, the school district, the family, the child. I am not one to say, well, you're wrong because you do that or you do that. We all possess knowledge. You may be dead right in how you raise your kid. And I may be dead right in how I raise my kid, and those may be two different answers. What it doesn't mean is you're more Christian or I'm more Christian because I chose to do it another way. So that's like the reality of how, you know, because the food sacrificed to idols, who cares? That's the kind of stuff we, we fuss over. Secondly is the weak Christian. And that gets the idea of if you say you're uh, the weak Christian, um, again, I admit I'm the weak Christian in many ways. My faith is weak. I know that there's nothing I can do that, God would not accept me. I mean, there's things I'm afraid to do because I think somehow I won't be as accepted to God. Now, I should, I should filter everything between does this please the Lord? But it should never be he'll love me less because I fell in that area. And so I tend to, for my life, and this includes drinking for me, is to be very conservative on that side of things. Partly because I know what I did in college. Secondly, I didn't want my kids to do the same thing in college. Thirdly, I have relatives who are alcoholics who some of them died because of this stuff. And so I'm, I'm strict in that area. Does having a drink mean I'm less of a Christian? The Bible says no. So I'm the weak one here. But what the Bible is speaking to you is here. Hey, you strong ones who know you have complete freedom, think about me. Think about your relatives. Think about others. And if never eat barbecue again because of them, then you're acting in love. That's the flip on this thing. And it's hard. I'll, I'll get to the hard partners if I haven't already. Thirdly is, I, I wrestled over how to do the walking Christian. And, and my point here, I almost label this the way of Christ. But here's the point. Is this is where the rubber meets the road. It's one thing to say, I love my brothers and sisters in Christ until we disagree about something. Now you got to put it on the pavement. Now you have to say, this is how, again, Romans 13 and 1 Corinthians 13, this is the law of love. You want to really love somebody, then when they disagree with you, you yield your rights to them. That's what Christ did. That's what we do. And so it's so easy to say, I believe this and that, so therefore, you know, I'm, I'm a good Christian and all that. But man... This is where I yell at you and yell at radios. Show me the Bible verse that says you're supposed to act like that. You're going to have a tough time coming up with that one. And so, it, it, again, when I say the walking Christian, what I mean is this is how you actually live it out. And what happens through time and through history, through denominations even, is we find those that agree with us on the most things, and we hang out with those people the most of the time. And then at some point we fight over something and we go start another church or start another group or something. And we, we try and find where everybody agrees on everything. You're going to be a very lonely person if you find the whole world agrees with you on something, right? So that's how we live this stuff out.
Thirdly, defining moments. And what I mean by that heading is this. Is it's in these difficult decisions and moments and stuff that we fight with is this proves what's in your heart. And I don't mean it's a defining moment like we decide what we stand on these issues. I mean how we react to these differences is a defining moment. It reveals the, the root that's in your heart and how you relate to other people who disagree with you on certain things. And I'll give you three sub points. One, it's a picture of the gospel. I've already danced around this a few times. But Jesus Christ made a way for people so far from God to be united with God and when we can do that with one another, we show the world what the gospel is all about. By this, they will know that you're my disciples, that you love one another. And I want to add, even in the things you disagree with. Now, let me say this again, just in case it's not clear. Back to the disputable and indisputable matters. I mentioned one. I mentioned the amendments that are coming up. This does not mean um, we're affirming of sin. There are certain, I mentioned the abortion thing. Let me also add this to this, just so there's no confusion here. When it comes to family and gender and sexuality, we also stand on what the biblical side says about that. So don't leave here saying, well, the pastor got, went woke this morning, okay? There are disputable matters and there are indisputable matters. I can still love and be compassionate towards somebody I disagree with. But again, I'm not talking about it out there. I'm talking about it in here. And I'm talking about things that the Bible does not speak as clearly about as they do on some issues. And so we can stand on what is true. Do it lovingly and compassionately. So don't leave here thinking, well, he said everything goes. It's, it's, that's not where we're going with this. I'm talking about in-house, that kind of stuff. But it is a picture of the gospel. It's somebody so far from you can be united with you by the blood of Jesus Christ because that's what Jesus did on the cross. And if you've not accepted that, I'll get, this will be point three actually, but if you've not accepted that, you will never be able to live the kind of life I'm calling us to here. Because you love, why? Because he first loved you. And if you don't understand that Jesus did this for you, you'll never be able to extend it to somebody else. Okay? Secondly is the people of grace. And I love it because our name is, of a church is grace, so it, it works out handily. Um, I, would I would love it if the people of Smithville said, you know, those people at grace, they love each other. I also, the deeper meaning is we understand what grace is all about. We understand what God did for us. Grace is undeserved mercy. Absolutely nothing I've done earns favor with God. It is strictly what Jesus did for me. If I can accept that for myself and apply that even to my own living, I can share that or extend that to other people. So I hope we're the people of grace. And then here's the third point, the power of God. You can't do this. You can't. Unless... Jesus has saved you, taken up resident in your heart through his scriptures and his Holy Spirit and even the help of other believers helps you live this kind of life. I'm convinced that this is one of those areas, I know it is because I've thought about it this week, is every day, multiple times, as I'm preparing this message, it takes me back to the cross. That dummy just did that. This dummy just did that. There's a verse in Titus. I'll, I'll end with this. At one time, we too were foolish and disobedient and deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and a renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. I was all those things that I get mad at other people for being, and yet Jesus died for me. So I can extend that, but I can only do that by the power of God. Okay? I, don't, I don't think an unsaved person can live with such love. And the, the world has this totally upside down. They define love as just accepting anything and everything. Right? I know your brain just went there. Don't be thinking about the culture right now. Love is pointing out truth, speaking it in love. But it's, it's thinking about other people above yourself. In our world that defines love differently divides and divides and divides and divides. And we in the church can love on the truth and come together in these things and be unified. So let's pray. 
God, thank you for your word. It addresses things um, that are a real challenge. And, and God, in our unsaved heart, cannot accept. We can't live this out. God, if there's anyone here today that thinks somehow because they've led a better life than others or even a better life than they could have, that somehow that makes them right with you. Help them see that they are just as far from you as anybody else and they need the grace of Jesus Christ. May we have no knowledge that puffs us up. God, help us love one another in these ways. Um. It's hard, God, and that's why we need your Holy Spirit to help us walk through this. God, but I know it's powerful. I know when the world can see a, a bunch of people who love one another despite differences in, in certain areas because they understand what Jesus did, um, what a powerful thing that is. So I do accept, I, I ask God that you maybe for the first time show somebody their need for a Savior. We've already mentioned the person that thinks they're so good, but God, there may be somebody here that thinks they're so bad, that they've done horrible things, that somehow you wouldn't accept them. Part of the truth of this is nobody is so far from you, they can't come to you through Christ. So God, whether it's for the first time coming to you by grace or just realizing how significant and how, as we're about to sing, amazing it is, Help us extend that to one another as well. God, my prayer has been that you would grow us as believers and that you would glorify your son, Jesus Christ, as we seek to live these out by your strength and by your power. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, we're going to sing Amazing Grace, and that's the whole point of this. If you don't understand how amazing grace is, you won't do this, all right? Let's stand and sing. Amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost but now I'm found with blind but now I Grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear? Yeah.
shall soon dissolve like snow the sun forbear to shine but God who called me here below will be forever mine my chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior just friends of me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now. Dear Jesus, thank you for um, teaching us these truths, uh, for calling us to follow uh, your footsteps, but most importantly, thank you for being the supreme example of love, and uh, may that infect us in such a way that we love one another, and it even extends, God, to those far, far from you. So may we live this out in Jesus' name for your glory. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great week. My chains are